This food bank farm is the second food bank farm. Many of you may be familiar with the first food bank farm over on Bay Road that awesome. started in 1992 in collaboration with Michael Doctor. Uh, that farm is continue, it continues to exist and the food bank farm continue, food bank continues to own it. Uh, the new farmer for now about nine, 10 years is Ben Peralt and his wife, uh, Liz, uh, from Mountain View Farm CSA. They've been farming it ever since. And in both cases, whether it was Michael Doctor or, or Ben Peralt at Mountain View, uh, in lieu of cash rent for leasing the land from the food bank, we get a share of the harvest. That's what inspired us to buy this farm, which we did in 2020. Operates pretty much in the same model most of the land 35 acres mainly on that side of the road and a little bit on that side is leased to lakeside uh, lakeside organics uh, hadley and uh, getting forth at atlas farm and again in lieu of cash rent we get a share of the harvest uh, but what's distinct about this farm is that we hired lee gadway uh, with our, our communications and education coordinator uh, who recruits volunteers to work on this two acre uh, parcel, uh, which we call Cultivating for Community, which is a regenerative farming and education initiative. And with that, I turn it over to you. Hey everyone, thanks for coming. Um, so like Andrew said, everything inside the, the white deer fence is cultivating for community, along with this little small section over here and the two greenhouses. Uh, everything here is minimal till organic. We, we do crop rotations uh, next year with the extension of the full two acres. I hope to have two blocks that I call them in uh, fallow slash cover crop for the year. And that fallow slash cover crop would ultimately move around as I am also um, doing crop rotations. We also mix crops here, like we plant radishes and carrots together, so as much soil is covered as, at all times as possible. Uh, we mix things like eggplant and calendula. Uh, we also mix in a lot of flowers, other flowers like zinnias. Uh, those zinnias right there were self-seeded from last year, but we left them. It made it really hard to harvest tomatoes, because I don't know if you can tell from where you are, those are actually in our footpaths. Uh, but they were so amazing, we couldn't cut them down. Um, we plant tons of, tons of flowers throughout the farm, so there's breaks for our bees. Uh, Andrew didn't mention this, but we also have a beehive on the property, just in the five acres that we just acquired this year. And we see honeybees and native bees working together over here, and it gives them breaks throughout the, uh, the whole two acres. Uh, we do use some silage tarp to help with re weed suppression here. Um, there's a little bit of controversy about uh, using silage tarps going forward as an organic method. For now, it's still practice until we, we find some more data on that. We're going to continue to use it because it works so well. You can flail mow or weed whack an entire section. You put a, in the heart of the summer, you can put a silage tarp down in two to three weeks, depending on how heavy the crop was. You can have it back and just clear out the debris, throw on a fresh layer of compost and be ready to plant. Uh, we do a lot of nitrogen fixation plants. We, I rotate my beans and my peas throughout the, the crop, uh, the, the whole two acres. Uh, in the far corner right now, we actually have a bunch of peas getting ready to go in. We're going to build that far corner I keep talking about. We're going to continue building that. And there's about 20 or 30 beds that we'll complete this fall for next spring and summer planting. Um, some of it has peas on it right now, which I pulled the silage tarp off of two to three weeks ago. We're growing those on, then we'll put some cardboard down, and then we'll put compost on to build the beds for that section and then the silage tarp will come off the next section past that and then we'll just keep moving that silage tarp around uh, if anyone wants to walk around and ask more questions where do all the vegetables that's great. go oh uh sorry all of our vegetables get donated here um, in the valley we donate to amherst survival center first baptist church of amherst and united way united way of pioneer valley which has three food pantries in hamden county chicopee springfield and holyoke yeah, none, none of our food actually even touches the food bank. Uh, we harvest on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and it goes right to those donation locations. 
Um, it's usually there by noon, 11 o'clock on all of those days. And we have about, this summer we've had about 500 volunteers almost on the farm? Yes, about 500 volunteers. Um, we are starting to speed up. Summers are really slow, so we're getting a lot more school groups in again starting this week. We now actually also have more volunteer groups coming in. We have one tomorrow and then another one on Friday. Uh, so volunteers numbers are going to start taking a sharp upturn again. Um, and then it'll help us wrap up the season because we still have a lot of harvest left for the year. There are certain things dying off. Uh, eggplant is dying off, although still seems to be running strong. I keep thinking about getting rid of it and then there's enough to stay on there. I keep it around right now because it is being a trap crop for flea beetles at the moment. I had thought about hacking it down to get rid of it and I noticed that all the flea beetles were right there next to um, some Napa style cabbage and it's not touching the cabbage. So it's gonna stay as long as I can let it and as long as the flea beetles stay there. So before you see the farm, my last plug. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> no, I'm following you. Um, consider getting involved. Yeah, volunteer. We'd love to have your support if you're willing and able and interested. Uh, also, you should know that a portion of the harvest that Atlas Farm and Lakeside Organics uh, harvest is actually sold to the Springfield Public Schools and it's that organic vegetable finds its way into school meals that feel, feeds kids uh, facing food insecurity as well as all of the food that's grown here and the, and the portion that we receive also. We, the food bank, it comes back to our new food warehouse resource education and advocacy center in Chicopee, Massachusetts where we distribute over a million uh, meals a month to about 115,000 people. So check out our website, learn more about it, and now check out the tour. Go show them what you got. Come on, everyone. It'll be, this is the fun part. <laughs> Where do you get your compost? Uh, right now we get it from We Care Denali out of Connecticut. Um, the, we Care Denali, they'll deliver anywhere, uh, but they do charge you trucking fees. We bring it in 35 yards at a time. So uh, we pay for a whole triaxle at a time. It is, uh, it's very great compost. It's very affordable. Uh, it's easily accessible. I'm pretty sure they have smaller trucks if you don't want 35 yards at a time. <laughs> uh, we are looking at another place in Connecticut that may be comparable, uh, but we haven't done any research on that yet. Uh, so yeah, here's what's left of our, our eggplant and calendula. Calendula is still doing amazing. Um, we're gonna start saving, we've been saving some of the seed for next year's calendula. Um, if you wanna grab a head that's gone to seed, feel free to grab them because we have more than enough. Uh, it won't be true to color because they were mixed. The eggplant we harvested Friday and it's still thriving. Uh, next past that uh, we have uh, round cabbage, then past that we have uh, tall, taller cabbage and then two beds of daikons, um, alpine style. Uh, over here we have tons of kohlrabi, some more of the Napa style cabbage. Then to the right of our photographer, we have uh, more, more kohlrabi and uh, more cabbage. We have one last tiny slow bed of leeks left. We had a major um, rodent slash groundhog issue this year. <laughs> I did the math and they ate three to 4,000 pounds of food. Um, there was one planting of Swiss chard that they ate so much of it, you couldn't even tell that we'd planted Swiss chard two days later. Like there was like two spots that were like this big and me and the person who had planted it were the only two that could tell that we had planted it there. Uh, well, except for the drip tape. The drip tape was still there. Uh, the zinnias are amazing. Tomorrow will probably be one of our last days of tomatoes. I'll probably just decide to pull all the green ones tomorrow and get rid of them as sad as it is. But we still do have an education section where the tomatoes seem to still be thriving and the second greenhouse, the closest to where we were talking, is still full of tomatoes. And we're gonna, 
I'm gonna see if I can go to mid-October in there and then I'll change it over to greens for the winter. Um, we're in the process of getting two caterpillar tunnels also and between the two caterpillar tunnels and the greenhouses we're going to continue to grow all winter uh, unheated so we'll just be kales and spinaches so we can continue donating um, we still have a decent amount of summer squash with these cold nights they're still doing really well um, what else do we have? We have a small section of beets over there. Beans are still doing fairly well. Okra is now reaching six foot tall. You can see they're way back in that yellow uh, corner where all the yellow flowers are uh, past the burnt out carrot. And then just below that where you can't see is a ton of kale and collards. We can all walk around and keep walking. We don't have to stop here. Uh, uh, get your we care Denali okay. out of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Use a permanent, I didn't mention this before, we use a permanent bed system. Um, I say that tentatively because I want to make them all uniform. So we're going to start moving like everything this way up a little bit. Which, uh, don't worry, there's worms all over that cabbage. <laughs> I'm hoping that's a trap crop too and they don't touch that round cabbage over there. <laughs> it's the only reason it's left out at this point. Everyone's like, there's worms all over this, why aren't you cutting it? And I'm like, hey, if the worms stay those cabbages, everything's fine. Um, we, this year, have been spraying nematodes. They work for a while, but you have to stay on top of it and spray them often and they're relatively not cheap, especially if you want the organic classified ones. Um, I think we're going to spray this week and we've sprayed five times this year. We have such a small amount that I do see a decline in July and August, which talking to some other bigger farmers around here, they're like, well, I never see them disappear. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, I did. <laughs> Are you spraying eggs or live worms? Uh, we're spraying eggs. Oh. And then, um, then they hatch and then they kill everything. Supposedly, who knows? You're mixing a powder in water and you never get to see any of that. <laughs> so you just cross your fingers and say, yeah, it's working. <laughs> uh, we do see uh, for um, blanking right now on another pest that we, aphids. Um, we use assassin bugs in the greenhouses and we do see, uh, we have seen a very good amount of success with those. As a matter of fact, we just released the assassin bugs a couple weeks ago and they hatched like yesterday. It's really fun to say you're releasing the assassin bugs and they don't do anything because it's eggs on a piece of paper. <laughs> uh, does anyone have any questions? Um, yeah, yeah, especially really like take into account the demographics of many food bank recipients. Um, do you take into account like culturally relevant vegetables and fruits? Uh, yes, that's why uh, we, so we grow the okra, um, we're growing the, the Napa style cabbage. We had had uh, a couple of other, th a lot more squashes last year. We didn't, part of the summer months, we fell behind on weeding. So we didn't get a lot of our winter squashes out. Um, we're, I grow a lot of the, the daikon style radishes for kimchi. Cabbages for sauerkrauts. I um, heard about this amazing thing while I was distributing food last year called glumkies. I haven't had a chance to make them yet, but they sound amazing. You take cabbage, like traditional cabbage, round cabbage, and you wrap um, like uh, it's not Italian, but an Italian style red sauce in with sausages uh, or loose sausage, and you make a roll out of it. it sounds phenomenal to me, but uh, this winter I'll make some. Uh, can't wait for winter. Those this year are probably the most um, culturally relevant. Uh, hot peppers and sweet peppers that we have. Other than that, I'm cultivating the list as much as I can. We have hackerai turnips. Um, there's two beds down there that we just started, so there's no foliage up yet. And I know climate's also a limiting factor. Uh, I'm finding a lot of the 
the Southern Pacific stuff does really well in the cold seasons. Uh, springs and falls, they do really well in this area. Um, Cause it's still, the nights are really cool. And um, we're getting ready to bring out a bunch of bok choys and joy choys and all of the choys. There's so many names for them <laughs> at this point, um, but it'll be great. Uh, those are those are some of my favorite vegetables. Uh, I was telling someone earlier that I, I really wish that I could shop this farm. Uh, I grew I grew 15 to 20 different tomatoes this year, and I can't find some of them anywhere. <laughs> like I grew like mushroom baskets, green zebras, gin fizzes, and I'm like they're all looking gorgeous. And I I love that I give them away, but I'm like man, I want to just pick some of these up somewhere. And I scour all the farms, I can't find any. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I, it's really happy. Uh, it's the best part of my job is that I get to give it all away. And I get to give all the cool things that I would want, um, that I would want to grow and eat, um, you know, for people that necessarily wouldn't be able to purchase these types of vegetables. Um, especially the, like, things like the tomatoes and some of the squashes. Um, so I've gone to a couple of distributions and uh, I'm really happy that I'm also doing more greens in the winter because I went to one last year and it was basically our greens and thank you for the donation from the place that donated it but it was a lot of sugary goods and like pre-baked stuff that um, if we wanted to get into that I'd start talking about partially hydrogenated oils and how we shouldn't eat those either and most of those products had them in them I just closed my eyes and turned around. <laughs> So though, like uh, Joe and Gideon, they grow what they, because all of their foods are in their, rota their rotation, so I don't know, you can't miss all the carrots when you drove in. Um, those, that field was all butternut squash last year. Mm -hmm. And then this field that's all leeks and then cabbages slash collards, last year was all tomatoes. And that, so they, because they rent so many and lease so many spaces, they're, they're just rotating. And, uh, that's actually Andrew, okay. but you know, <laughs> uh, that's, that's above yeah, me. That's yeah. yeah. Um, so when you crop plan, you don't necessarily like coordinate uh, with other donations. No, not, not of their, because we're going to two different places or three different places. Cause they, their stuff would go to the food bank or through Sodexo to the public school system. Um, they're coordinated completely differently than ours because ours technically stays off the grid um, and it's donated right to the location. We, we coordinate in here. I really like to know, so I've become friends with the, like, the field manager and stuff because everything from the Red Barn that way was potatoes this year, so I knew we were gonna get Colorado potato beetles over here. And we got a lot on the eggplant. <laughs> um, but because we, in relative terms, we have what? It's six beds over there. We just seek and destroy for a week and a half and then we didn't see them anymore. It's, it's amazing. You know, you have to ask people to do gross things and squish them, but, <laughs> but it's kind of like Star Wars. You just walk around, pew, 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 and then you're done. <laughs> So it's just you on staff and then relying on volunteer labor for the rest of... Um, yes and no. We have, uh, Andrew was talking about Amanda, our community engagement and volunteer coordinator. She's on the farm three days a week uh, on days that volunteers are here, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And then we have a full-time apprentice who's been here since April, uh, late March. And then I have, we also have two part-time field staff. Um, so yeah, we're pretty, you know, we're pretty well off. It's, it's a little, you know, it's, it's bipolar. You go with the ups and downs, like, you know, all of a sudden, like tomorrow, we're going to have probably 18 volunteers. So it's going to be a very different day where it was just me and one of the part-time field staff today. <laughs> and we we're trying to weed whack everything. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, you know, try the, the maintenance is a little, like I mowed, 
that side. I managed to weed whack from that corner almost all the way around. Uh, I ended up stopping like right by the red kale over there. So we still have a little bit uh, to keep down. The bunny rabbits on top of pests are really bad because the poultry netting doesn't do anything for them because they're small enough to just go in those small squares and they don't care. Uh, especially the little babies in the spring. They laugh at you as they're running out of the fence. <laughs> As you're practicing your Farmer McGregor look. And <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? You mentioned saving the calendula seed. How much of the seeds and starts and everything that you're buying are you saving versus buying versus donation? So this was, this is like a personal hobby of mine. I've, I, since I've been farming, I've always saved my own beans. A few years ago, I started saving my own tomatoes. Um, I had had the idea that I would do carrot this year. Um, but we we have wild carrot, so it's probably not any good anyway. Um, the calendula seems easy. Uh, I, basically, I'm picking easy things. Squashes, as long as it's not a, a hybrid, I save. It just, you know, it's kind of insignificant, but it cuts down on our seed costs maybe by, if I can save a hundred bucks, then it's a hundred bucks that I get to spend on like we won't say irrigation because I don't want to spend hundred bucks on irrigation. <laughs> <laughs> buy a new tool from a new scuffle hoe. I would get to buy two scuffle hoes for that. <laughs> Where do you do all your starts? Uh, in the greenhouse, closest to the to that side of the farm. Say <laughs> um, Yeah, if you, we can go over there now. We still have some of our fall stuff in there. If you'd and like to take a look. That? Do what? Do you uh, in the spring we'll heat it because we start tomatoes and peppers so early. We'll heat it for about two or three weeks. Uh, right now they are heated at night because temperatures are falling below 55, but not for the starts. They're for the tomatoes and the peppers and the cucumbers that are in there. As soon as those are gone, I'll shut the heat off and it'll just be kales and spinaches in there all winter long. Maybe some onions tiptoeing into that. I've bought the seed and I just need to just plant it and say, yes, you're going to do onions with it. <laughs> but it does make my life harder. Because <laughs> then uh, it's not a problem. Of, I don't think it's going to be a problem of growing. It's uh, logistics when I want to plant them in the spring. Because onions will come out after when I want to start putting the tomatoes in there. So yeah, this is tomatoes that are going to go on for about another month. They're still producing fruit at an amazing level. So um, the things that are 10 feet tall are tomatoes, plants. Huh? The, the, the tall ones in here are all tomatoes? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they're, they're indeterminates. They were probably planted in seeded, I think, seed date for these were March 18th. Yeah. Uh, I think next year I'm going to push them back a little bit into April. I don't think we quite needed them that early. I did consider topping them this year. Because uh, we had the same thing happen last year where they just grew past the, um, the, center, the center pipe and they're hard to harvest. I basically have to get on a chair. I was going to say, even with your height. Yeah. I think... Uh, I've I was, never seen them this tall before. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, they, they did the same thing last year. I'm thinking next year about getting a, um, an orchard ladder. Okay. So I can just, because their orchard okay. ladders are three prong, you yeah. just shove it right through the tomatoes and into the footpath on the <laughs> other side. Um, like yeah, I was thinking an eight-footer. <laughs> that you slide along? Yeah. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> I like that idea. Uh, we did have a problem when I went to turn on the heat. Uh, mud wasps had made nests oh. in the uh, intake, uh, so they weren't turning on. But now I have one more thing that I can troubleshoot before I call the propane people. And I'm also going to cover the heating units up next year. Because we're only... We're only going to need heat for four weeks and very minimally, like I'm having the heat come on at 55 and shut off at 58. So any night that's 55 or above, it won't even come on. It's, and it will stay relatively warm there. Uh, would we have like a 43 degree night? It was still over 50 in here. So it's still not even going to turn on that much. Let's go to the other one. Here, yeah, yeah, I planted marigold and some calendula too. Okay. Um, I like to plant flowers with everything. Marigold specifically to keep pests away from tomatoes. Oh, yeah. oh, interesting. Um, 
control that tells you if the temperature is going? What was that? Do you have a remote control to tell you if it's going? No, so that's one of the couple of things that I've asked for, yeah. but I'll probably purchase. So there are a couple of things that I, so our heating vents are all automated. They are set to temperature parameters. There's, there's another computer I can buy on top of that that will help me water, and then I'm gonna get a wireless device so I can send things to my phone all the time. Um, that's gonna be the next step for... It doesn't wake you up, but... Well, <laughs> if it's a temperature alert, I wanna know about it. <laughs> so we have a couple of things going on. Uh, these are all Benito's benches over here. Uh, our incubator farmer whose space is just past our white fence and just below that white, uh, that big house. And then these are all of our fall starts so far, right now. We'll plant some more, but... Where's the, we gotta get, what do you have here? This is all brassicas. These are, well, that's not true. There are some lettuces. There's lettuces, pak choy, bok choy, kale, and more kale. There's no, all the kohlrabi's outside at this point. And then we started to plant some lettuce in here. The cucumbers were planted really late and they're just starting last week they started producing. Peppers are starting to produce. These tomatoes have been phenomenal all summer long. They've been producing uh, this row of plants, we'll say 30, 50 pounds a week uh, of gorgeous red grape tomatoes. And then behind them we have a row of eggplant that's doing really well. Do you give the particular plants any kind of fertilizer of any type? We foliar spray with Neptune's Harvest. Neptune's Harvest. Okay, yeah. so that's organic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, with the solanaceous yeah. plants, we'll, um, we'll do the crab and fish shell meal, which mm -hmm. is ca added calcium. Yes. Uh, but also be in the liquid form, it has nitrogen. I usually just sprinkle the crumbs or get the meal, but this year I decided to roll the dice with that because I had heard some good things, mostly from Neptune's Harvest, they're on a podcast, but they're, they know what they're doing. Uh, they've been doing it for so long now that you, know, you can trust what they say. Uh, and then the rest of the time is just their fish emulsion on everything. Um, and we foliar spray. Sorry, are the cucumber flowers edible? Uh, they are. They don't taste very good. Uh, unless they're stuffed with cream cheese and fried. <laughs> so you might as well just fry cream cheese and leave the cucumber flowers out of the whole equation. Not bad. That's what I always, it's not, it's like, I mean, have you eaten nasturtium flowers? Yes. I it's, know. you know, it's like nasturtium flower, you know. Anytime I eat a flower, I'm just like, hmm. A lot of times it's the That's that great. Flowers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I find that with squash flowers also. I'm just like, hmm. Yeah, this is a delicacy, definitely. <laughs> but that's just one person's opinion. Thanks for the tour. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? What did you go to school for? Uh, I went to school for art and photography. <laughs> Always good to have yeah. skills and abilities. Yeah, I'm self-taught for farming. I've been doing this for, I mean, I've always had a green thumb um, ever since elementary school. Uh, and then about 16 years ago, I found out how little of our food that we eat and consume in New England was grown here. So I started a little garden with maybe this much lettuce. It all failed. And then, uh, then tomatoes and then then I went to, through a couple of programs, a uh, farm business planning class, and then I started my own farm, my own CSA, and then, then I started farming for other people. In this area, or? Uh, no, I was in North Central Mass. Uh, Ashby, it's just above Fitchburg. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Kind of figured. Yeah. First. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, it was, uh, it was where I had land access. I had friends of the family that own uh, uh, 450 acres. So yeah. they were like, hey, you need an acre? I'm like, yeah, actually I do. And they're like, hey, we can spare a bunch. Oh. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, I think experience with agriculture is, is a very big variable that you've 
It, 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 thank you. Uh, it is, I would say, doing is the best way to learn it. Um, I mean, you can read. I, I've taken a couple of master classes through other groups, and I would say doing it is, is the best way to learn. And by doing it more, asking questions, talking to other farmers, which is the hardest thing in the world to do as a farmer, because farmers are so busy, they don't have time to talk to anyone. So they're always like, it's so exciting to see like this time of year when farmers are getting together again, because they, they have time again. Um, but during the, during the growing season, it's just like, you know, highs and nods from moving vehicles. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for coming. This has been great. Do you feel like you've had a big transition between doing stuff for profit with the CSA versus like this more? Um, this, I would say, has been, we'll say, liberating. Uh, I'm still confined to a budget uh, because I'm tied to the food bank. It is bigger than I was used to on my, I mean, my CSA was 25 members. Uh, so really small. <laughs> Um, but being able to like grow all of the vegetables that I would have wanted to grow and have staff and then just hand it out to people. It's really fun. I actually yeah. went to First Baptist once last fall. It was great. <laughs> um, and then, you know, that, that would, it's definitely a change. Like next year I'll probably rein myself in and not grow as many varieties of tomatoes. Um, that was fun, but. Well, now you know what does well here too. Yeah, exactly. Like, the, and there was a, not, a, you know, a lot of the varieties that I thought were going to be great didn't do well. Yeah. Uh, thorns, uh, terracotta. Yeah. It's this uh, terracotta and green colored tomato. Didn't do well at all. Huh. Probably won't do that again. Except I did say this, I still have like five or eight seeds left. I'll probably experiment with those five or eight left. Because you can't let seed go to waste. You can't at all. It's ridiculous what farmers are like, well, I have five seeds left. I've got to grow it. Because you never know. There's, uh, I grew this year an ana Ananas uh, Noir from Baker Creek. And I'm having trouble finding the same variety. Um, I'm really horrible with my garden at home. I basically grew a bunch of tomatoes, gave most of them away, and then grew two plants in a shady spot where tomatoes aren't going to grow because I'd get home and I'd be like, oh, I should move those, but I'm going to go talk to my son and sit on the couch because I've been doing this all day. <laughs> um, they did well here, um, but they are that, that variety of the Ananas Noir isn't available anymore. Yeah. Um, it's basically green, red, yellow, and I, I have grown them before here, and the flavor of palette is uh, phenomenal. Have you checked Seed Savers Exchange? Uh, I haven't looked at Seed Savers. Uh, Baker Creek didn't have it. Yeah. Uh, I'd really like to grow that Purple Galaxy, yeah. but it's a cross, so yeah. it's, um, or it's genetically modified. It's not, a, if it was a cross, it'd be okay, but yeah. genetically modified. And they found out after they had printed I a whole bunch of that, yeah. yeah. I was super excited about it, but yeah. you, could, you could acquire the seeds, but I, at that point I had found out they, yeah. were, they were genetically modified. So I was like, nope, not growing those. <laughs> ordered earlier and not read the news. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just order early and don't read anything. <laughs> But yeah. They're very dramatic looking though, I understand the appeal. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Like, they were phenomenal, especially the cover of Baker Creek they did with one. Yeah, it was so gorgeous. I'm gonna pull up a picture because they are really like... Yeah, they're, oh my God, these things look phenomenal. You'd be like, oh my goodness, a tomato, that color? They're like, they're so violet, it's bl almost black. Like, yeah. And there's a whole thing about it being more, um, Usually dense because of the coloration. They're like really bright, striking dark purple. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of the purples are also higher in antioxidants. Yeah, exactly. Um, yes. Which is why. So the it was really funny to watch the groundhogs whenever they decimated yeah. a crop this spring. They went after the purple stuff first. Really? Yeah. Oh. So obviously they know too. Yeah. And like. <laughs> <laughs> That's a double damage. It was like, ah, oh, even in here, we had some purple tatsoi. Yeah. And it was looking amazing. I came in one day, it was all gone. And you could see it, they had dug under the, uh, the overhead door. <laughs>